yeah, man, I, I don't know what else to say. Like, my audience wanted me to cover all of the seasons of TNG on my channel, and like, that makes sense, but I knew going in that a numbered series on YouTube was going to have increasingly smaller view counts with each installment. I mean, this is the reason that Let's Plays died years ago. What the hell? Get the f out of here, man. Get the f Hey guys, Tyler here. So, Star Trek The Next Generation, it's one of the greatest shows of all time, am I right? The sequel series to one of the most influential sci-fi programs of the 20th century. I've made four videos analyzing the lore of each season of TNG cataloging key additions to Star Trek's canon, as well as examining themes, characterization, and other story elements. I have, as well, offered my opinions on the quality of each episode. But apparently, YouTube doesn't like that I've been making a four-part, now five-part series and isn't promoting these videos to as many new people. Look, I know that you guys have been enjoying the episode-by-episode -episode format, but it's killing me in the algorithm. I just want to eat. But I couldn't just not finish the series, and I know that a lot of you also missed the longer retrospectives. While I have less to say about certain episodes in these last few seasons, I thought I'd combine my concise commentary with the deep dive format that a lot of you guys have been pining for. You could say that I'm offering the best of both worlds. So, in this video, I'd like to take an overall look at TNG seasons 5, 6, and 7, examining just how the show changed in its final three seasons. Let's get started. Season 5 opens with the conclusion of the two-part episode, Redemption which chronicles the Klingon Civil War. Remember that Chancellor Gowron faces a threat from House Duras, while Duras himself has been killed by Worf, revenge for framing Worf's father for the attack on Kittimer 20 years prior. Gowron still faces a challenge from Duras' son, Toral. That's where we pick up in Part 2. Prejudice and the struggle to overcome it is one of the prevailing themes of this outing, one of the most obvious examples involving Data. Data is placed in command of the USS Sutherland, part of a blockade to stop the flow of supplies from the Romulans to Duras's fleet. But the Sutherland's senior officer, Hobson, has trouble taking orders from an android. Excuse me, sir. I'd like to request a transfer. May I ask why? I don't believe I'd be a good first officer for you. Your service record to date suggests you would perform that function adequately. No, 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 that's not what I mean. I don't think I'd be a good first officer for you. Why? Frankly, sir, I don't believe in your ability to command this ship. I understand your concerns. Request denied. Redemption Part 2 also fleshes out the life story of Sela, who is teased in the Season 4 episode, The Mind's Eye, and first makes an appearance at the end of Redemption Part 1. We should not discount Jean-Luc Picard yet. He is human. And humans have a way of showing up when you least expect them. We learn, of course, that she is the daughter of a Romulan general and Tasha Yar from the alternate timeline of Yesterday's Enterprise. Picard has trouble believing her story, viewing Sela merely as a distraction. Doubts? I'm full of them. Long story short, Gowron orders a full assault on Duras' ships so that they'll be forced to call for supplies, exposing the Romulan involvement once and for all. After Data foils Seal's last-ditch efforts, Duras' forces are left to surrender, ending the Klingon Civil War. Worf is given the opportunity to kill Toral, but Worf, seeing but a child at the end of his blade, refuses and forbids his brother Kern from killing Toral either. Continuing the motif of tensions arising from differences in culture, are the next two episodes, Darmok and Ensign Roe. The first one is a brilliant exploration of diplomacy and communication between peoples with seemingly insurmountable differences. Darmok introduces the Temerians, whose language is based on metaphors derived from their history and mythology. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Darmok 
Angelad on the ocean. Ensign Rowe introduces the Bajorans and Cardassian occupation of Bajor that has been going on for some 40 years. We're also introduced to the character Roe Laren, played by Michelle Forbes. Roe has a very casual disregard for respect and procedure, in many ways the polar opposite of what is expected of an officer serving aboard the Enterprise. I don't want to be here any more than you want me to be here, sir. Then why did you take this assignment? If I may be equally candid, it's better than prison. Better than prison? There are officers who wait years to serve on this ship. Being called back into Starfleet was not my idea. Nor ours. After rooting out the real culprit behind an attack on a Federation colony, Roe earns her place on board the ship as a trusted and valuable officer. The episode indicts the Federation as bystanders to the genocide of the Bajoran people a biting criticism of the Prime Directive. We come to learn that Bajoran civilization is half a million years old, and the Bajoran people are willing to do anything to overthrow the Cardassians. This theme of prejudice is just as present in Episode 4, Silicon Avatar, in which a xenologist named Dr. Kila Mar comes aboard the Enterprise to study the aftermath of an attack by the Crystalline Entity. Dr. Mar lost her son in the attack on Omicron Theta, the colony where Data and his brother Lore were built. She falsely believes Data has the same motivations as Lore, who lured the creature to Omicron Theta, but she soon relents. She becomes enamored with the fact that Data's creator, Dr. Soong, programmed the colonists' experiences into Data's positronic brain, asking Data to play some of her son's logs so she can hear his voice again. And the sci-fi conflict of the episode derives from the crew's struggles over whether to make contact with the crystalline entity, hoping to dissuade it from killing more humans, or destroy it when they get the chance. Dr. Mar. Dr. Mar, we must return to the intermittent signal. The entity is beginning to resonate. Vibrations are increasing. Dr. Mar, stop the transmission. That is an order. It's for you, Rennie. I did it for you. Mr. Data, shut down the transmission. I cannot stop the graviton signal, Captain. Dr. Mar has isolated the access code. You say you did it for him. But I do not believe he would have wanted that. Yes. I believe your son would be very sad now. More significant long-term consequences for the crew, however, emerge in Episode 5, Disaster. A quantum filament disables the Enterprise, separating the crew into various parts of the ship to face perils alone. Picard is trapped in a turbo lift with a group of kids. Troy is left in command on the bridge, accompanied by O'Brien and Roe. Crusher and Geordi are stuck in one of the cargo bays and must depressurize it in order to put out a plasma fire. Riker and Data attempt to make their way to main engineering under the assumption that all of the bridge crew are dead. You must now change the input matrix of my secondary optical port and then connect the ODN conduit. That is not the correct port, sir. And Worf, who is really funny in this episode, helps Keiko O'Brien deliver her baby in 10 forward. Have you ever done this before? Yes. Oh. No. I took the Starfleet emergency medical course. In a computerized simulation, I assisted in delivery of a human baby. Sometimes it doesn't go by the book, Worf. Congratulations. You are fully dilated to 10 centimeters. You may now give birth. That's what I've been doing. Bearing down is the next stage. It should start at full dilation. Why has it not begun? I don't know. I don't think it's up to me. It happens when it happens. Oh. Computer simulation was not like this. Uh. Did you feel an uncontrollable urge to push? Uh. Good. You are bearing down. Uh. Push, Keiko. Uh. Push. Uh. Push. Push. Uh. This episode, in my opinion, balances very well the juxtaposing tones of humor and drama, with all of the tension of a disaster movie. But it's also very important for two characters in particular, Picard and Troy. 
Picard because this experience helps him somewhat overcome his uncomfortableness around children, and Troy because this episode puts her on track to take the bridge officer's examination later in the series. Oh, and of course, it features the birth of Molly O'Brien. These first five strong entries are followed by one that is widely regarded as weaker, however. The game. After Riker brings back an addictive augmented reality game from Ryza and gets the crew hooked, it's up to a visiting cadet Wesley Crusher and Ensign Robin Leffler, played by Ashley Judd, to save the ship. The 1980s drug PSA vibes are strong with this one. Whatever this thing does, it must feel pretty good. Even though the episode aired in 1991. But it's not a completely useless episode. For one thing, Judd delivers a performance that's more fun to watch than lots of Wesley's previous flings, not the least of which because Leffler is a more grounded, three-dimensional character. Your neutrinos are drifting. Throw what? We're also introduced to Robin's Laws, a collection of 102 adages she's written down whenever she learns something essential. Ultimately, we find out that the game is really a plot by the Katarians to destroy the Federation from the inside. But this plan is foiled by Wesley, Leffler, and Data, the latter of whom is immune to the game's effects. I will say this episode gets shit on a lot, and for good reason, but it's just so damn funny. And by the way, this isn't the last we'll see of the Katarians. The character Naomi Wildman in Voyager is a half Katarian, half human hybrid, although her Katarian makeup design is far different from TNG's. Katarian, Katarian, cuff shut the f up. TNG's exploration of diplomacy resumes with one of the most memorable two parters in Star Trek history unification, which is dedicated to Gene Roddenberry, who unfortunately passed away shortly before this episode aired. Unification follows Picard and Data as they are tasked with finding out why Ambassador Spock has seemingly defected. As it turns out, P hasn't defected. He's been consorting with the Romulan underground movement. He has also been in talks with Pardek, a Romulan senator and advocate of Vulcan Romulan reunification, which both see as a potential solution to the conflict that has separated the two cousin species from millennia. Picard expresses his disappointment with Spock's cowboy diplomacy, the sort of under-the-table negotiation, without first consulting the Federation Council. We ultimately find out that Pardek is in cahoots with Sela who has orchestrated the theft of three Vulcan ships as part of a Romulan peace envoy, really a Trojan horse designed to launch an attack on Vulcan. Several actors get to shine in this outing. Brent Spiner in particular gets to show off his comedic range. I'm sure the Klingons found it amusing to put us in here together. Since I do not require sleep, I propose you take the shelf. I rather enjoy writing. I don't get to do it very often in this job. Perhaps you would be happier in another job. And the scenes Data shares with Spock are some of the best character-focused moments of the episode. The two discuss their different approaches to humanity. While Spock has chosen to suppress his emotions through Kolinar, Data instead strives to become more human. We also get to see Sarek, who is in the final throes of Bendai Syndrome, one last time before the character passes away. Peace and long life. After the invasion plot is foiled, Pardek loses his credibility with the Romulan underground, but the seeds of hope are planted that one day Vulcan and Romulus can reconcile, something we see come to fruition as per Star Trek Discovery's Unification 3. Unification is bookended by another whimsical one-off installment, A Matter of Time, in which the Enterprise is visited by a time traveler, Berlinghoff Rasmussen. Rasmussen introduces himself as a historian from the 26th century who has traveled back in time to observe the Enterprise crew's handling of a crisis at Panthara 4. At one point, Picard is torn on whether to implement a highly risky solution and asks Rasmussen what choice to make, but Rasmussen cannot reveal this. Picard concedes there may be some sort of temporal prime directive preventing Rasmussen from interfering, but as it turns out, Rasmussen is actually 
actually from the 22nd century in New Jersey at that. Having stolen his time ship and taken it on a joyride, Rasmussen is apprehended, but we later learn in Star Trek Voyager that the Federation does employ a temporal prime directive by the 29th century in order to preserve the integrity of the timeline. The first half of this season is rounded out by a relatively weaker bunch of episodes, starting with New Ground, in which Worf's adoptive mother, Helena Rojenko, brings Worf's son Alexander aboard the Enterprise, and insists Worf take care of the boy. Worf's parents, his mother explains, are getting older and are having trouble keeping up with Alexander. Worf agrees to take his son in, only to find that Alexander continues to have behavioral problems, such as lying and stealing. Worf seeks advice from Troy on how to address these problems, planting the very earliest seeds of the romantic relationship between Worf and Troy in Season 7. New Ground is by no means terrible, but it does suffer in that the sci-fi B-plot, wherein the Enterprise helps test a new type of propulsion called the Soliton Wave, is incredibly uninteresting. Alexander has acted shamefully, and as his father I must now deal with him but I find that I would rather fight 10 Balduck warriors than face one small child. After this is Hero Worship, essentially a rehash of the season three episode of The Bonding, as Data helps a young boy, the sole survivor of a wrecked research vessel, cope with the loss of his parents. This time, however, the boy emulates Data's emotionless android personality to suppress guilt over his belief that he caused the accident, but in truth, it was a gravitational phenomenon that claimed the ship, something that almost destroys the Enterprise as well. And then there's the appropriately titled Violations, which features the Yulians, one of whom telepathically sexually assaults Troy while trying to frame his father for the act. And of course, this is something that's never brought up again. While all of these episodes have their weaknesses, the next one, the Masterpiece Society, in my opinion, takes the cake. In it, the Enterprise visits a colony of genetically perfect humans and attempts to save the colony from a rogue stellar core fragment. Deanna falls in love with the colony's leader, Aaron Connor, in one of the, and I'm not sorry about this, most boring, if not the most boring, romances in Star Trek history. It's not enough that the acting in this episode is some of the flattest in season five, but the colony's purpose, to create a paradise populated by people without flaws, whatever that means, is just such an icky concept to me. It's thinly veiled eugenics, everyone born with a role in society predetermined, just authoritarian nonsense. Regardless, one highlight of the episode is Geordi's interactions with the colonists. He figures out that the same tech that powers his visor can be used to send a high energy pulse through the ship's tractor system and move the stellar core fragment. He remarks about the irony of a prosthetic made for a blind man saving a society where he would have been terminated as a fertilized embryo. Of course, this sort of exploration of Geordi's disability and his visor saving the day is much better handled in season three's The Enemy. TNG's exciting plot lines pick back up with Conundrum, one of my favorites of the season. This outing sees an alien vessel emit an energy beam that causes all of the personnel on board the Enterprise to lose their long-term memories, specifically biographical information, as is common in retrograde amnesia. They do, however, retain their skills in operating the ship, but what they also don't realize is that there's someone on the bridge who wasn't there before, wearing a Starfleet uniform, and who also claims memory loss. But how did this happen? What did this to us? We're all trying to find the guy who did this! The senior staff is eventually able to access their personnel files to relearn their identities, and we learn the name of this mystery officer, Macduff. The ship is drawn to the command center of the Lycians, with whom the Federation is supposedly at war. But the crew senses that something's not right about this war, and they grow even more suspicious of Macduff. They eventually figure out what's going on, and Dr. Crusher is able to restore the crew's long-term memories. One of the highlights of this episode is Michelle Forbes' performance. We get to see a more comedic side of Ensign Rowe as, with her guard down and without the previous knowledge of her contentious relationship with Riker, the two engage in a brief romance. What if I snore in my sleep? What makes you think you're going to get any sleep? Conundrum exists back to back with another fun sci-fi romp. Power Play, in which an away team consisting of Troy, 
O'Brien, and Data are possessed by the disembodied souls of prisoners on a moon of Mabu 6. At first, the three claim to be the senior staff of the 22nd Century Federation starship Essex, but Picard is skeptical as the three take hostages, hoping to intimidate Picard into letting them escape the planet. Picard believes this is something a Starfleet crew would never do, although Worf points out that they very well could have gone mad. Ultimately, the prisoner's true identity is revealed, and their plan to free hundreds of other prisoners is thwarted. While Power Play doesn't really tackle any major themes or moral or political issues in the same way that lots of other episodes in TNG do, it still does function well as an action piece. Ethical considerations are, however, front and center in episode 16, um, ethics, in which Worf is paralyzed from the waist down after an accident that has shattered his spinal cord. Worf asks Riker to help him commit suicide, to which Riker soundly objects, sparking discussion around cultural relativism and the ethics of suicide. A visiting neurological specialist named Dr. Toby Russell performs an experimental surgery to restore Worf's mobility, despite objections from Dr. Crusher, who prefers a more proven therapy that would restore 60 to 70 percent of Worf's mobility. Worf ends up choosing the experimental procedure, which luckily works, but Crusher still admonishes Russell for rushing her research and not taking the proper time to weigh risks. All right, this one. Definitely not gonna piss anybody off. Any controversy elicited by ethics is dwarfed, however, by the subsequent The Outcast. Not just because the latter explores themes of sexual orientation, but because of how it explores those themes. In this installment, Riker falls in love with Soren, a member of an androgynous alien species called the Janai. The Janai used to have two sexes, but they have since evolved and view gender as primitive. Soren, like some other Janai, strays away from the norm and secretly identifies as female, a fact that, if made public, would prompt the authorities to force her to undergo electroshock conversion therapy. While the writing staff did receive some angry letters from social conservatives, they actually got more letters from gay viewers who felt that the episode's exploration of sexuality didn't go far enough. This is, admittedly, a major problem with allegory in sci-fi, the catch-all connection between the Janai, homosexuality, and transgender identities is so vague that the episode uses a lot of words to say not so much. That said, despite the relative weakness of its political themes, I do think that The Outcast succeeds in other areas. It has some really funny moments. We prefer to stay warm by sleeping with a friend. Commander. Tell me about your sexual organs. And the episode subverts expectations by having Riker fail in his mission. Soren is caught, and she undergoes conversion therapy to erase her feminine identity. Twos, sixes, and aces are wild. That is a woman's game. Cause and effect marks the return of pure sci-fi in season five. The Enterprise is caught in a time loop in the Typhon Expanse, and the loop keeps repeating after a Miranda-class vessel accidentally rams into the Enterprise's warp nacelle. The crew eventually experiences enough collective deja vu to realize something is up, and they make preparations to change the outcome of the next loop. After crisis is averted, the Enterprise hails the other vessel, the USS Bozeman, commanded by Captain Fraser Crane, uh, I mean Morgan Bateson. While the Enterprise crew has been stuck in the loop for two and a half weeks, the Bozeman has been stuck for 90 years. They've got a lot of catching up to do. This fantastically directed entry precedes a string of more character-focused installments, starting with The First Duty in which Wesley Crusher participates in a cover-up of the death of one of his friends. Wesley and the other members of the Starfleet Academy flight team Nova Squadron had been practicing near Saturn when a catastrophic collision killed cadet Joshua Albert. Nova Squadron's leader, Nicholas Locarno, played by Robert Duncan McNeil, blames Albert for getting scared though it's clear to everyone that something's not adding up. The episode functions brilliantly as a courtroom drama, and is probably the best Wesley Crusher episode, really humanizing him in a way he hadn't been before. It's also the first time we're introduced to Boothby, the groundskeeper 
at Starfleet Academy. Probably the weakest entry in Season 5 is Cost of Living which is another Loaxana Troy-focused episode. This time she's on the Enterprise preparing for her wedding to a man who, get this, she's never met before. She meddles in Worf and Alexander's relationship, undermining Deanna's counseling work and getting Alexander in trouble. This episode is pretty forgettable, all things considered, though it does have its moments, like Loaxana showing up to her wedding naked in hopes of getting her fiancé to call off the wedding. This is infamous, infamous! We must leave immediately! The subsequent installment, The Perfect Mate, introduces the Creosian species. The Enterprise is tasked with transporting a gift from the leader of Creos to the leader of Vault Minor, whose worlds have been at war for centuries. This gift turns out to be a female empath born and trained to meet the desires of any man. While Picard is incensed by the Creosian's participation in humanoid trafficking, Picard finds himself tempted by the empath, Kamala, played by Famke Janssen. Fun fact, Famke Janssen goes on to play Jean Grey opposite Patrick Stewart's Professor Charles Xavier in the original X-Men movies. The Perfect Mate also confirms that there are dolphins aboard the Enterprise, which later media has tied in with a reference to Cetacean Ops in a previous episode. Oh, what's next? Imaginary friend? Uh, I take back what I said about cost of living. This is probably the episode of season 5 that's the weakest for me and least interesting upon rewatch. As the Enterprise explores an uncharted nebula, Ensign Sutter's daughter Clara's imaginary friend Isabella becomes terrifyingly real. Brought to life by an alien intelligence, curious about the energy output of the Enterprise's graviton field generators. But Isabella seeks to destroy the Enterprise crew for the way they treat Clara. You see, these aliens, energy-based life forms, lack a concept of parenting, but come to an understanding, allowing the ship to pass through the nebula. While this episode does have its defenders, and the performance of the child actors is commendable at least, the premise is one that just doesn't really work as well for TNG in my view, better so for something like The Twilight Zone. Regardless, Imaginary Friend precedes another one of the most seminal installments in the franchise, I Borg. In it, the Enterprise finds an injured Borg drone under the wreckage of a crashed ship, and the crew brings the drone aboard to give him medical attention. The drone begins to show signs of individuality, and Geordi gives him the name Hugh. The episode not only functions well on a sci-fi level, but also excels as both a character drama and in terms of ethical considerations. You alright? You felt sorry for me. Look what it got you. I, Borg, is also the first episode to introduce Borg designations, specifically Hugh's designation, Third of Five, which serves as the template for Seven of Nine's designation in Star Trek Voyager. In episode 24, the next phase, Following a transporter accident, LaForge and Ensign Rowe are presumed dead. However, they are very much still alive, just out of phase with the rest of their environment. No one can see them, and the two must get to the bottom of what has happened and figure out a way to return to normal. Another pure sci-fi story, this episode is beloved by fans and is one of my personal favorites. It's also followed up by an even more acclaimed entry, The Inner Light. After encountering a strange probe, Picard is struck by a beam of energy and wakes up as Cayman, a resident evil village. A uh, wait, a resident in a village on the planet Catan. As Crusher and Ogawa try to revive Picard on the bridge, Picard lives as Cayman through Catan's final decades. But after Picard wakes up on the bridge, it's only been 20 minutes in the real world. This episode is highly praised for its performances, as well as its intense emotional impact, and it even won a Hugo Award and was nominated for an Emmy. But while the episode should be one of the most consequential in the franchise for Picard, 
hard. Ronald D. Moore has spoken about how TNG's episodic structure prevented the writers from effectively exploring just how much this ancestor simulation would have transformed Picard's life. That said, the inner light isn't totally inconsequential. Not at all. Future installments feature nods to it in the form of the Resican Flute, an artifact that reminds Picard of his time on Catan. And much like Disaster, this episode is instrumental in changing Picard's attitude towards children, as he has two of them during his time on Catan. While the inner light is certainly emotional, one of my biggest issues with it is, um, Picard didn't consent to any of this. He was effectively forced to leave his life behind for 30 years and be held captive on this dying planet. And then all of a sudden, boom, surprise, it was a simulation the whole time. Forget about your wife, kids, and community. They all died over a thousand years ago. <gasps> what the hell? Whoa, whoa, where am I? 55 years. Hell? Not bad, Morty. You, you kind of wasted your 30s, though, with that whole bird watching phase. Where, where's my wife? Morty, you were just playing a game. Look at this. You beat cancer and then you went back to work at the carpet store? Truly, this is a violation of the same caliber as Jean-Luc's assimilation by the Borg, arguably more so given the time differential. And by far and away, it does not receive a requisite amount of attention in future installments. And lest you think today's woke culture is influencing my opinion on this, just know that I have felt this way ever since I first saw the episode back in like 2012. By the way, the concept of a Starfleet officer experiencing decades worth of simulated memories is explored again with Miles O'Brien in the episode Hard Time. Finally, Time's Arrow Part 1. The Enterprise has been recalled back to Earth to investigate the mysterious discovery of Data's disembodied head in a cavern underneath San Francisco. The head is dated to the late 19th century, implying that it is Data's destiny to die on Earth in that time period. This leads the Enterprise crew on a trail of clues that leads them to Davidia 2, home of interdimensional shapeshifters who live just out of phase with normal space-time and seem to be harvesting human neural energy from the 19th century on Earth. After Data uses a phase discriminator in his positronic net to investigate the away team's surroundings, he finds himself in 19th century San Francisco, where he seeks the aid of Guinan in order to get back home. But their conversation is overheard by none other than Mark Twain, aka Samuel Clemens. Back in the 24th century, Guinan tells Picard he must join the away team, or they might never meet. Picard reluctantly does so, and the away team adapts the method they used for Data to shift their phase. Sound, sounds like a drug trip. They then travel through another temporal distortion in hopes of retrieving Data from the 19th century. TNG Season 5, like every season before, it has its ups and downs. While it does contain some of the most impactful character writing in the show and features more pure sci-fi stories, the emphasis on political, moral, and social issues present earlier in the season does tend to fade a bit as the season goes on. A few of this season's episodes do earn TNG the reputation of being a soap opera set in space, a designation that will linger with it, unfortunately, for the remainder of the series' run. But season five also introduces some of the most memorable. Why do I write alliteration in my vi <laughs> scripts? <laughs> but do you ever just edit your script while you're reading it? God knows I do that. Yeah, sometimes. Like, huh, this sentence can't be said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but season five also introduces some of the most memorable elements of the show, like Rolaren's character, Sela's backstory, and top-notch episodes like Darmok. I do think that season five is, however, the first since season three that contains episodes I'd consider completely skippable, those being Hero Worship, Violations, The Masterpiece Society, Cost of Living, and Imaginary Friend. You could also throw in the game, but frankly it's too damn funny to pass up if you aren't pressed for time. And while I have issues with New Ground, it is a key development in Worf and Alexander Rojenko's arcs. But interestingly enough, while Season 5 was a lot weaker than I remembered on rewatch, Season 6 was a lot stronger than I remembered. Like a lot stronger. Okay, so this is, okay, we're about one third of the way through. <laughs> Oh my f***ing god, this is going to be an hour and a half long video. 
season six opens with Time's Arrow Part Two, which wraps up a lot of the mysteries introduced in the season five finale and has a greater focus on Samuel Clemens. For better or worse. Yeah, I unfortunately on rewatch, Time's Arrow just doesn't really hold up as much for me. Werewolf. The conclusion of this two-parter is followed up by Realm of Fear, in which Lieutenant Barkley's fear of transporting is put on display when he is attacked by a creature inside the transporter beam. Oh, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! This episode features lots of key dialogue about transporter safety. You realize if the imaging scanners are off even one thousandth of a percent, that's why each pad has four redundant scanners. If any one scanner fails, the other three take over. And, in my opinion, puts to rest the ridiculous notion that the transporter is some kind of death machine, as Barkley retains continuity of consciousness in the matter stream. Following this somewhat underrated installment is episode 3, Man of the People, which in my opinion is one of the most unwatchable episodes of the entire franchise. I think I even skipped it on my previous rewatch, which means until recently I hadn't seen this episode in probably over 10 years. After an ambassador is brought aboard to mediate peace talks to end a civil war, Deanna becomes attracted to him and starts to act erratically. Long story short, he's draining the life energy from his victims, which Crusher is able to reverse through some techno babble. I'm telling you, man, there's just, there's just way too many episodes where the writers have Deanna fall for some sketchy f or get violated in some way. What have they got against her? Thankfully, we can put the memory of this episode behind us with the next one, Relics, in which Riker and Geordi revive Montgomery Scott from being stuck unconscious in a transport buffer for approximately 75 years. Scott was working with the crew of the Janolan to investigate a Dyson Sphere, the first of its kind to be featured in Star Trek. Scott tries to make himself useful to the Enterprise crew again, but finds that his expertise is about 75 years out of date, making him feel even more out of place and nostalgic for the 23rd century. No bloody A, B, C, or D. But he and Geordi salvage some of the Genoan systems to help the Enterprise escape from the Dyson Sphere when it's pulled in. After all, Geordi says, a lot of the Genoan's tech operates on the same basic principles as the Enterprise's newer systems. While it's fun to see Scotty and the premise of this episode is pretty interesting, I kind of think the sci-fi storyline in Relics is just okay, but the character stuff is fantastic. What is it? It is. It is. It is green. Relics precedes another one of my favorites, the sci fi horror entry Schisms, in which members of the crew are abducted in their sleep and experimented upon by Solanogen based life forms native to a subspace dimension. Most of the episode is dedicated to the build-up to this reveal, and the mystery of what exactly is happening to the crew, exemplified by the holodeck scene, is quite exhilarating. It's a shame, though, that the subspace aliens haven't been brought back, though they are fleshed out more in beta canon. Oh, and Schisms also introduces Data's iconic poem, Ode to Spot. Felis Catus, is your taxonomic nomenclature an endothermic quadruped, carnivorous by nature? It often serves to illustrate the state of your emotion. Commander, you have anticipated my denouement. However, the sentiment is appreciated. I will continue. The next entry, True Q, introduces Amanda Rogers, the daughter of 2Q who took human form. She is assigned to the Enterprise for an internship hoping to attend Starfleet Academy, but a visiting Q wishes to help Amanda hone her powers, putting her in the difficult position of deciding between corporeal and non-corporeal existence. I always look forward to this episode on rewatch as I think it's a brilliant character exploration with some pretty standout performances. Well, if it isn't number two. 
Many of these strengths are also present in the underrated Rascals, in which a transporter accident regresses Picard, Ensign Rowe, Guinan, and Keiko O'Brien physiologically to the age of 12, though they retain their adult memories. After a group of Ferengi hijack the Enterprise, something that happens way too often, the four, along with Alexander Rojenko, hatch a plan to retake the ship. So, son, how are you? Are you winning, son? <sighs> no, Dad, I'm not winning. I don't even play games anymore. They're not fun. I just sit and scroll Twitter mindlessly for hours. It's the same every night. I'm tired, Dad. I understand, son. When I was your age, I felt the same way. We tell you about how harder things were in my days, but really we know it's the same. We just want to believe that our kids are living in a better world, rather than accepting that we forged a worse one. For that, I'm sorry, son. And I understand that we have our vices. What is Twitter to you was the park to us. We were no better. But you can be, son. You can be. And I love you. Thanks, number one. He's my number one dad. They're eventually returned to their correct ages using some more transporter science. My favorite part of this episode is the interaction between Guinan and Ro, who each have different perspectives on childhood. There must have been some part of childhood that you didn't loathe. But oh man, talk about poor Miles. Throughout TNG and DS9, he's given the memories of a 20-year prison sentence, on another occasion dies and is replaced by a counterpart of himself from an alternate timeline, and in this episode, his wife is reverted to the body of a 12-year-old girl. Talk about hard times. Season 6 offers a recreational breather with A Fistful of Datas, a holodeck western adventure. In this outing, a computer malfunction traps Worf, Alexander and Troy in the simulation and gives the holodeck characters the appearance and enhanced abilities of Data. A welcome one-off installment, I still have to take issue with this episode coining the phrase ancient west to describe the old American frontier. Ancient history refers to the period between 3000 BC and 500 AD, so even if we're being generous in Star Trek terms, ancient would be like the time of the Vikings, not the friggin' 1800s. Anyway, moral and ethical quandaries return with the quality of life, which introduces the Exocomps, an artificial life form created by a scientist from Tyrus 7 to be used as maintenance tools. But Data believes the Exocomps to be sentient, and sets out to prove his hypothesis. The episode is prescient in a number of ways, including forecasting the rise of literal machine learning. There is also a recurring exocomp character in Lower Decks named Peanut Hamper. I joined Starfleet to piss off my dad. Why? Cells, 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 interlinked, 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 within cells, interlinked, within cells, interlinked. Why didn't you say that three times? After the quality of life, we are delivered one of the most highly regarded and divisive two parters of TNG chain of command. Picard, Worf, and Crusher are tasked with a secret mission in Cardassian territory to investigate a possible metagenic weapon, basically a biological weapon. Instead of Riker becoming acting captain in accordance with the chain of command, Aren't you glad I dragged you away for a whole day just for that sh <laughs> The Enterprise is placed under the command of Captain Edward Jellico, who negotiated the Federation Cardassian Treaty. Admiral Necheyev believes Jellico is uniquely qualified to get the Enterprise more battle ready and spearhead further negotiations with the Cardassians, as they're eyeing the border system of Minos Corva. Towards the end of part one, Picard is captured by the Cardassians, and is interrogated and tortured in part two, resulting in brilliant performances from Patrick Stewart and David Warner. There are 
we learn about the relationship of Cardassian families with the state, and get some lore on the military takeover of Cardassia, which I expound upon in my video about Cardassian history. Link in the description. Look at it! But besides this brilliant, gut-wrenching torture plot line, the biggest contention of Chain of Command, in my experience, is Jellicoe's behavior, not just towards the crew, but towards everyone. I've always been of the mind that he had unreasonable expectations, although I do credit him with finally putting Deanna in a proper standard uniform. She's a damn bridge officer, she should have always been in one. She was in one in the pilot, for God's sakes. What happened? While some have ragged on Will for being stubborn, I actually think that Jellicoe's command style was not conducive to a productive work environment. But admittedly, there's a lot of nuance to the situation. I even reached out to a handful of other Star Trek YouTubers to get their thoughts and opinions on Jellico. I received a lot of thoughts and opinions, too much for the runtime of this retrospective, but I'm releasing a standalone video about Jellico and Chain of Command a week after this video comes out, so keep your eyes peeled. And the full discussion is also included in the two hour extended cut of this retrospective, available now to members and patrons at the $5 level and above. Following this gritty two-parter is Ship in a Bottle, which brings back Moriarty, who as we find out has been intermittently conscious for the past four years as his program has been stored in protected memory. Moriarty strongly wishes to leave the holodeck, even begging Picard to allow his companion, Countess Regina Bartholomew, to join Moriarty in the real world. Moriarty traps Picard, Data, and Barclay in the holodeck, but the Starfleet officers figure out what's going on and reprogram the simulation to get one over on Moriarty. This is a great mystery episode with some brilliant performances, and the concept of holograms being able to roam free is revisited in Voyager. But who knows? Our reality may be very much like theirs, and all this might just be an elaborate simulation. Speaking of mystery and Aquiel, Geordi falls in love with a woman accused of murder on an isolated communication relay station. A pretty cut and dry crime investigation episode, Aquiel introduces the Hellean species in the form of Lieutenant Junior Grade Aquiel Unari. While this episode is widely regarded as being the weakest of season six, the mystery in and of itself, as well as various subplots, are rather intriguing. But the chemistry between LeVar Burton and actress Renee Jones just isn't there. Regardless, another compelling mystery is delivered in Face of the Enemy, in which Troy is kidnapped and surgically altered to pass as a member of the Romulan Tal Shiar. She's tasked with helping the Romulan underground movement smuggle three political leaders to Federation space. Face of the Enemy once again brings back Carolyn Seymour, who played another Romulan in Contagion and Malkorian scientist Marasta Yale in First Contact to play Commander Toreth. Carolyn Seymour and Marina Sirtis are f***ing excellent in this episode, probably the best Romulan story on TNG. The stakes are even higher in Tapestry, truly one of the most iconic installments of Star Trek. After being attacked on an away mission, Picard finds himself in the afterlife, only to come face to face with Q. No. I am not dead, because I refuse to believe that the afterlife is run by you. The universe is not so badly designed. Q offers Picard the chance of a lifetime to change a crucial moment in his life, the night he was stabbed in the heart by a Nausicaan, a story Picard told Wesley Crusher in the season two episode, Samaritan Snare. Was this before the Klingons joined the Federation? No. The episode also introduces the billiards-like bar game, Domjot. Tapestry is widely regarded as one of the best TNG episodes, and it's definitely one of my favorites. I'm always a sucker for time travel stories. It has been criticized, however, for basically being the plot of It's a Wonderful Life, and the episode does leave some open-ended questions, but you could say that's part of its strength. It's a beautiful story. It gets you right here, doesn't it? Tapestry's character-driven drama is succeeded by the two-part episode Birthright, 
the first part of which features two seemingly disconnected storylines that are nevertheless related by theme. In the B plot, Data discovers that he has the ability to dream, part of a program that Noonien Soong wrote to activate once Data reaches a certain level of emotional development. The main plot, however, involves Worf searching for his father Moog after he is told Moog is alive in a Romulan prison camp. As it turns out, this is not true, but Worf does find that a number of the Kittimer colonists were imprisoned by the Romulans, and Worf tries to teach the children in the camp about Klingon culture. But his provocations are seen by many as disruptive, since the camp has developed into a peaceful community over the past 20 years. While watching both parts of Birthright back to back, I couldn't help but think that they should have been cut down into one episode or the A and B plots separated entirely, even though, again, they are connected by theme since we don't get a proper follow-up with Data in Part 2. And you could argue that Julian Bashir's cameo in Part 1 was rather pointless. But maybe I'm wrong. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. In any event, Birthright is an important episode as it does introduce Data's dream program, and it's a fantastic character study for Worf, his racist attitudes towards the Romulans compelling him to do something good, which is to liberate the children of this prison camp so they can return to the homeworld. Oh my god. Escaping imprisonment is the M.O. of Picard in the next entry, Starship Mine, when he is trapped on the Enterprise as it undergoes an energy sweep that is lethal to humans. He's tasked with thwarting a terrorist plot by the technicians to steal trilithium resin from the ship's warp core. The episode is really well directed and is probably one of the most violent of TNG, which I frankly welcome as a dark one-off departure. This episode also features Tim Russ as one of the technicians prior to his regular role as Tuvok on Voyager. Freeze! I'm thirsty. I said freeze! I'm just getting a drink. All right, I had your drink. Now, I want I you know, to- I know, I know. Freeze. Jean-Luc is also the focus of the next entry, Lessons, in which he falls in love with the new head of stellar cartography, Nella Darren. However, Picard is put in a difficult position when he's forced to assign her to a dangerous mission. This outing is a beautiful character-focused story with fantastic performances, and it's the closest thing we get to a follow-up to the inner light, as Picard shares with Darren the story of his resican flute. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you to understand what my music means to me. And what it means for me to be able to share it with someone. Speaking of ancient artifacts, episode 20, The Chase, is an even deeper exploration of Picard's fascination with archaeology, even featuring his mentor, Professor Galen, who comes to the Enterprise with a mystery to be solved. This puzzle ends up attracting the attention of the Klingons, Romulans, and Cardassians, and the final piece uncovers the truth about the origins of humanoid life in the galaxy. While this episode is generally well received, there is a legitimate question as to how necessary it is to explain in-universe the abundance of bipedal aliens in Star Trek's Milky Way. Obviously, the real-world reason is budgetary limitations, but in-universe, the existence of ancient humanoid progenitors who seeded the galaxy with their DNA does bear resemblance to the real concept of panspermia. Either way, the progenitor who appears at the end of the episode is played by Salome Jens, who went on to play the female changeling in Deep Space Nine. And her speech, as well as the episode itself, have been called very Roddenberry-esque by the production staff. The Chase precedes a couple other one-off stories that are nevertheless compelling in their own right. In episode 21, Frame of Mind, Riker fears that he is going insane when he keeps swapping places between the Enterprise, where he is rehearsing a play, 
and an alien hospital. The episode is really dark and intense, one of the most demanding episodes that Jonathan Frakes has had to carry, in his words, and is definitely one of the most memorable of season six. You gave a truly realistic interpretation of multi-infarct dementia. Thank you. Following this is Suspicions, in which Dr. Crusher risks her career and her life to prove that a Ferengi scientist's experimental shield was sabotaged by another scientist who hopes to capitalize on the technology. This tech, the metaphysic shield, allows a vessel to enter a star's corona and becomes important later on. Subsequently, Rightful Air continues the loose Klingon political arc by introducing a clone of Kalos the Unforgettable, whom Worf sees in a vision on the monastery planet Borath. This Kalos clone was created by the Borath clerics to challenge Garon's position as chancellor, but an friggin' Christian nationalist looking at But in order to avoid another civil war, Worf suggests the Empire bring back the position of Emperor as a ceremonial role to act as a moral guide for the Klingon people. Rightful Heir tackles religious themes with a vigor that, frankly, no previous episode of TNG does and features some great performances. Riker is the main focus again in Second Chances when the crew finds a transporter double of him on a planet he helped evacuate eight years prior. And it just so happens that this Riker is still intensely in love with Troy. Like Tapestry, Second Chances is a brilliant exploration of how the choices we make can put us on completely different life paths, even though this Riker didn't choose to be left behind. And pitting the two Rikers against each other over our wills, choice not to accept his own command, is brilliant as well. Ultimately, Riker's double adopts the name Thomas, their middle name, and accepts a transfer to the USS Gandhi before showing back up again as a Maquis sympathizer in Deep Space Nine. Second Chance's intense character study is followed by Timescape, another fun pure sci-fi story that evokes similar vibes to the next phase. Picard, Data, Troy, and Geordi must stop a warp core breach on the Enterprise as the ship engages in a power transfer to a Romulan warbird experiencing engine failure. As it turns out, a race of extra-dimensional life forms has been using the warbird's artificial quantum singularity, which powers the ship's faster-than-light engine to incubate their young, only to realize it's unstable. This episode is the second to be directed by Leonard Nimoy's son Adam, following Rascals, and also marks the first appearance of a runabout in TNG, a larger version of the traditional shuttlecraft and a vehicle more often seen in DS9. So far, it probably seems clear that season six is one of the strongest seasons, if not the strongest season, of TNG competing, in my opinion, with season four. It's got the best mix, many argue, of political thriller, character drama, moral quandaries, and pure sci-fi storytelling. And I'd largely concur with all of this. But I also remember season six for a less fond reason, that it's the beginning of the end for Star Trek The Next Generation. After delivering a knockout season with brilliant direction, great performances, for the most part, and episodes that frequently make must-watch lists for the series, season six of TNG is also the last great season of Star Trek until, arguably, season four of Deep Space Nine. And to presage this drop in quality is the, in my opinion, appropriately titled season six finale, part one of Descent. In Descent, the Enterprise crew once again encounters the Borg, but this time they're acting as individuals. And furthermore, as it turns out, they're acting under the direction of Data's brother Lore, who is allied with these drones to destroy the Federation. Data experiences his first true emotion, anger, when fighting one of the Borg drones and attempts to recreate this emotion, even to the point of risking his own life in the process. As I have said, many consider Descent to be the beginning of the end for TNG, but also the beginning of the end for the Borg, as they've now been reduced to cultists worshipping at the altar of lore rather than the more menacing, inhuman threat they represented when the Borg were first introduced. That said, Descent is not without its value, 
Picard is faced with the consequences of letting Hugh go at the end of I, Borg, once again eliciting the question of whether the moral choice is always the right one. Part 2 serves as the end of Lore's arc as Data is forced to deactivate him, removing the emotion chip and presaging Data's emotional journey in the TNG movies. Part 2 also features Crusher in command, and the Enterprise scenes have more of a focus on junior officers, highlighting how they act under pressure in one of the ship's crisis situations. And oh, would you look at that, the metaphasic shield comes back. Honestly, I agree with most of the criticisms of Descent. None of it really meshes together in the same way that a lot of other thematically heavy episodes do. Especially the synthetic supremacy thing. It's starting to get really tired and boring. And then, and then they take it up to 11 in Star Trek Picard. I mean, Mass Effect 1. <laughs> And I think elements of other franchises, like Mass Effect's Geth Heretics, deal with religious indoctrination better than Descent. But alas, this is just a preview of what's to come. Alright, six more pages. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Season 7 continues in earnest with liaisons, in which Picard, Worf, and Troy deal with visiting Yaran dignitaries who study foreign concepts in very extreme ways. Dignitaries assigned to Worf and Troy, respectively, explore the concepts of antagonism and pleasure. Another dignitary, Voval, accompanies Picard en route to the Yaran homeworld, but crashes their shuttle on a desolate planet. He then poses, initially unbeknownst to Picard, as a human woman named Anna, who has been stranded there for seven years. As I said, the Ayarans study human concepts with extreme, singular focus. You are an insulting, pompous fool. And if you were not an ambassador, I would disembowel you right here! Do not let my title inhibit you, Klingon. Ah! Yes. Good. And Voval, as Anna, is no exception, going so far as to, frankly, sexually assault Picard. I get what this episode is going for, but to say that it was effectively executed from a dramatic storytelling standpoint would be kind of stretching it. But if you thought that was bad, the subsequent episode, Interface, is when a lot of the production staff consider the show to have truly died. Not because the episode itself is like extremely awful or anything, but because it's rather boring and proves that the writing staff was running out of ideas. In this outing, Geordi uses a remote interface to explore the wreckage of a ship inside a gas giant, but he's distracted by an alien posing as his mother, whose ship mysteriously disappeared ten days earlier when traveling near the same gas giant. Notably, LeVar Burton welcomed this late insight into his character's backstory, although he noted that he wished more had been done throughout the run of the series. And as producer Naren Shankar noted, the idea of a remote interface face like the one in the show is arguably not very futuristic. Even one tied directly to the human brain is something we're likely to develop this century, not 400 years into the future. Nevertheless, Interface gives way to the more interesting two-parter, Gambit, in which Riker is captured by pirates pillaging Romulan archaeological sites and Picard has also infiltrated their ranks. The pirates eventually mutiny against their captain, and Picard comes to find out that a Vulcan isolationist named T'Pol, posing as a Romulan, seeks a powerful weapon that channels negative thoughts into destructive energy. Gambit marks the first mention of the Debrun, a Romulan offshoot species that inhabited local space roughly two millennia ago, and provides some more background regarding the Time of Awakening, the period in Vulcan history that sparked the Romulan exodus from the planet. If Captain Picard were here... He's not. I realize that, sir. But if he were, and he wanted to lead an away team, you would tell him that the captain's place is on the bridge. Not this time. No way. Not this time. Not this time. No. Not this time. Not this time. No way. We got you. Not a chance. Not this time. Not this time. Wrong. Not this time. Not this time. You're wrong. The surrealism is turned up to 11 in Phantasms, a compelling horror episode that has always stood out in my mind. I remember years ago watching this episode for the first time and later remembering nothing but the mouth. That's right, the mouth. <laughs> Wait, 
an illusion perceived by Data as he experiences a waking nightmare brought on by interphasic organisms that have infested the Enterprise's warp core. What kind of cake are you eating? It is a cellular peptide cake with mint frosting. Please, don't hurt me, Data. I am sorry, Counselor. No, don't! No! No! Data! I wonder, what would Dr. Freud say about the symbolism of devouring oneself? And you must talk to him. Tell him he is a pretty cat. And a good cat. I will feed him. Mental manipulation shows up yet again in Dark Page, which marks Loaxana Troy's final appearance on TNG, as she helps establish relations with a telepathic race called the Cairn. While Loaxana's trademark overbearingness is yet again on display, this episode is actually pretty poignant as we learn about what is perhaps Loaxana's biggest regret, the death of her eldest daughter, Kestra who as a child drowned in a lake near the Troy home on Beta Z. Deanna assures her mother that she must forgive herself for Kestra's death as it was a tragic accident. It's this moment that puts into perspective Loaxana's entire character. The guilt she has felt all these years about losing one daughter has informed the overprotective aspect of her relationship with Deanna. You could say it was a dark page in her life. Thanks, Dark Page. Now I feel like an asshole for calling Loaxana an annoying character in all those other episodes. Although, to be fair, I don't think that this tragic event really excuses how overbearing Loaxana is towards Deanna and being obsessed with like her finding a man and all that stuff. Just like, leave her alone, Jesus. <laughs> how can I explain? Tell me telepathically. I hope this gets more than 20,000 views. I hope it gets more than 30,000 views. We're working too hard again, aren't we? Yes, we are. Also, by the way, I think it's rather sweet how Deanna and Will's daughter in Star Trek Picard is also named Kestra. Even more character development is delivered in Attached as Picard and Crusher, after escaping imprisonment on an alien world, find that their thoughts are linked by a brain implant. Dance, the, it's the Neuralink again, Sh Jean-Luc finally admits his romantic feelings for Beverly, although it will be a while before she reciprocates. Fun fact, the planet featured in the episode, Kesprit, is a rare example of a world seeking Federation membership that is not politically united, sparking conversations about the merits of global government, both among fans and in the episode itself. This is followed by Force of Nature, TNG's rather on-the-nose allegory about climate change. After two Hikaran scientists present their findings that warp drive damages the fabric of subspace, warp speed limits are placed on all Federation starships except for emergencies. This episode was written more than six years after the signing of the Montreal Protocol to restore the ozone layer. Force of Nature is pretty boring and it doesn't help that the B-plot is entirely dedicated to something as mundane as Data Training Spot, who by the way is referred to from this episode forward as being female, while previously being referred to as male. Transporter accident? Or could it be that Spot is actually one of several orange cats on the Enterprise who have all wandered into Data's quarters? We may never know, but alas, this isn't the last episode that brings up more questions about Data's past, as the next entry, Inheritance, features Juliana Tainer, Data's mother of sorts, the wife of Dr. Soong, who was present when Data was created. Juliana was instrumental in giving Data his creativity, and we learn that there were other prototype androids Soong built before Lore, one of whom, before, we meet in Star Trek Nemesis. As it turns out though, this Juliana is also an android. 
The real Juliana died years ago. Her memories transferred to this new synthetic body via synaptic transfer, another process explored in detail in Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery. And by the way, it should go without saying that this whole, uh, she was an android the whole time trope just, I, I've never been a big fan of it. I mean, you know, yeah, they, they explain that she puts out a false bio breeding or whatever, but like still, it's just like, come on. Kind of stretching that suspension of disbelief a bit. Inheritance is succeeded by one of the most highly rated installments of the series, but one that comes dangerously close to jumping the shark. Parallels. Worf finds himself shifting through various parallel realities brought on by the eruption of a nearby quantum fissure. The episode works well for the most part on a dramatic level, with many of the changes being rather creative, such as Data having blue eyes in one reality and the Enterprise having a Cardassian pilot in another. The episode explains the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and introduces concepts like quantum signatures, the idea that each universe resonates on a quantum level with its own unique signature. It's worth noting, in my opinion, and probably my opinion alone, that the show Fringe not only features a similar scene where a character explains branching timelines, something we've all become familiar with thanks to Hollywood's oversaturation with multiverse stories, <clears throat> in game, but also makes significant use of this quantum signature concept, describing in detail how different parallel universes resonate at different frequencies. The moment parallels almost loses me, though, is when Lieutenant Wesley Crusher, a native of one of the quantum realities, hands the crew yet another Deus Ex Machina when he offers a technobabble solution to Worf's reality shifting. But more egregious, to many, is that this episode jumpstarts the arc in Season 7 featuring Worf and Deanna's romance, sparked by his discovery that in multiple other realities they are already married and have children. Following these events, Riker's former CO, Eric Pressman, comes aboard in The Pegasus to lead the Enterprise in a salvage operation, stirring up uncomfortable feelings about actions Riker took 12 years ago under Pressman's command. Long story short, the Pegasus was conducting experiments with a new type of cloaking device, a phase cloak that allows the ship to not only conceal itself, but also pass through solid matter. The only problem is, this type of tech is illegal under the Treaty of Algeron, negotiated in good faith, in good faith, in good faith, with the Romulans 60 years prior following the Tomed incident. The Pegasus is a pretty compelling mystery episode, although the memory of it has been kind of tarnished for some by the Enterprise finale, These Are the Voyages, which supposedly takes place concurrent with this episode. Yeah, who signed off on that again? The subsequent entry, Homeward, is also one of the final straws for me regarding the Prime Directive. After Worf's adopted brother Nikolai violates the Prime Directive by saving a group of villagers from their doomed planet, he spends the whole time being chastised by Picard and being painted as the villain when he's the one trying to save lives. Much like with Interface, I have to agree that this episode serves as yet another example of Season 7's decline in quality from the previous seasons, as yet again we're dragging out the relatives to mine them for character development. Another fun fact, the actress who plays Nikolai's wife, Penny Johnson Gerald, goes on to play Cassidy Yates in Deep Space Nine and Dr. Claire Finn in The Orville. Oh boy, here we go. Sub Rosa, the queen of bad Star Trek episodes. Or is it? That's right, I'm revisiting this old argument. I talked about this episode in my 2021 Halloween video. Don't you mean my 2021 Halloween video? <sighs> my bad ghost, Tyler. In Sub Rosa, after attending her grandmother's funeral on Caldos II, Beverly is visited by the mysterious entity known as Ronin, an anaphasic life form that inhabits a candle that her grandmother has kept lit for many years. Do not light that candle, and then go to that house. As it turns out, Ronan has been preying on the women in Beverly's family line for generations, and she finally puts a stop to this predation after coming to her senses. Thanks, Ghost Tyler. This episode is often listed as the worst of TNG, but 
damn it, to be honest, I just, I think there are way worse episodes in this series. I really do. The main thing that sets Sub Rosa apart from other Star Trek episodes is that it's just so damn goofy, both in premise and execution. But on rewatch, I can't really fault them for this. I think that Sub Rosa is f***ing hilarious. Nana. Nana's dead. Leave her alone! I mean, how can you not feel that way? Picard catches Beverly masturbating, for God's sakes. And, and by the way, this episode was directed by Jonathan Frakes. Do you believe in the power of a curse? How much money would it take to make you spend a night in a cemetery? And the fact that they were able to get away with as much as they did with this episode on network television in the 90s is frankly commendable. He knew exactly how I liked to be touched. The sensations were very real and extremely arousing. So I am glad that Sub Rosa exists. It is a genuine, rare example of a so bad it's good piece of media. TNG's increasing focus on junior officers peaks with lower decks, which depicts a mission of the Enterprise through the eyes of a group of junior officers. As these officers speculate about the nature of a covert rendezvous near the Cardassian border, Picard selects Bajoran Ensign Sito Jaxa, whom we first saw in Season 5's The First Duty, to accompany a Cardassian informant for the Federation back into Cardassian space. She is supposed to return to the Enterprise in an escape pod, but unfortunately, as the crew finds out, the escape pod is destroyed, presumably with her in it. This episode is definitely one of the strongest of Season 7 and naturally served as the primary inspiration for Star Trek Lower Decks, being series creator Mike McMahon's favorite episode of Star Trek. Following this is Thine Own Self, in which Data loses his memory while being stranded on a pre-warp planet. The B-plot sees Deanna finally complete her bridge officer's test to become a commander, overcoming significant hurdles and serving as the payoff to the setup from Season 5's disaster. The tension of the A-plot, in which the townsfolk become sick with radiation poisoning, derives from Data forgetting what radioactivity is, which is arguably a stretch even in an amnesia situation. Radioactive? What does that mean? I do not know. Perhaps it is my name. But there's enough to like about this episode that I think it overall functions pretty well. I believe you are reasoning by analogy. Wood, for example, does not contain fire simply because it is combustible nor does it contain rock simply because it is heavy. The subsequent installment delivers yet another data-focused story, Masks, in which the cultural archive of a long-extinct civilization, the Dyarse, begins to take over his body, leading him to exhibit multiple personality disorder. While Brent Spiner yet again gets to show his range, my biggest issue with Masks is that it's terribly boring, mainly because of the multiple rewrites this script went through. By the way, buckle up, because that's going to be a common theme throughout the rest of this video. The absolute dearth of interesting episodes in the remainder of Season 7. The next outing, The Eye of the Beholder, is no exception, as Deanna investigates the suicide of a young lieutenant aboard the Enterprise. She discovers that the suicide is connected to a murder committed when the Enterprise was still under construction, and that the murderer is still on board. I, I literally watched this episode a week, less than a week, before we're filming this video, and I... I Swear to God, I do not remember what happens. That's how uninteresting it is. The episode also advances Worf and Deanna's relationship arc, which is also touched on in the next episode, Genesis. After Dr. Crusher administers a treatment for Barclay's urodolin flu, the synthetic T-cells mutate and become airborne, causing Barclay and the other crew members to de-evolve into prehistoric creatures. While the science of this episode is highly questionable in a Michael Bay Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sort of way, the episode still does, in my opinion, function well as one of TNG's best horror episodes. That said, Genesis does remain divisive. Less divisive is Journey's End, which serves as the conclusion of Wesley Crusher's arc in TNG. And by less divisive, what I mean is everybody f***ing hates this episode. Let me just tell you, Wesley has some Pretty good moments in the middle seasons, you know, first duty and all that stuff, but like, this is just such a pathetic way to go out. He's suffering from gifted kid burnout, 
relatable. His grades slipping at Starfleet Academy and all the pressure he feels leading him to drop out. He goes on to become the white savior of a group of Native Americans who are being forced to give up their home as part of the new Federation Cardassian Treaty, which has created the Demilitarized Zone. God, again, talk about on the nose. I understand, but now is not the time Do you time know what they're trying to do? They're preparing to beam you away and take you to their ship. You're not gonna let them do that, are you? No, we won't. Leave now. I, for one, think the Trail of Tears was a bad thing. To be fair, this episode does point out the historical parallels with Indian removal, but it's simultaneously one of the most tone-deaf and preachy episodes of Star Trek, which is quite an accomplishment. As it turns out, the Traveler has been posing in red face the whole time, and he invites Wesley to accompany him to visit other planes of existence. This is definitely the natural conclusion for Wesley and the Traveler's arcs, but holy god is it rushed. The episode also includes an extended discussion about white guilt or more broadly, the responsibility for the crime of one's ancestors, which, to be honest, feels out of place for Star Trek's future. Family themes are more competently handled, however, in First Born. A mysterious family friend and advisor to the House of Moog comes aboard the Enterprise and encourages young Alexander to become a Klingon warrior. As it turns out, this man is Alexander from an alternate future in which Alexander's failure to become a warrior leads to Worf's premature death. Firstborn is really interesting because it actually does change the trajectory of Alexander's life. We see in Deep Space Nine that he does indeed join the Klingon Defense Force. And speaking of DS9, the concept of a son traveling back in time to save his father's life is revisited in, well, The Visitor. <sighs> Great. Another family episode. In Bloodlines, Ferengi Daimon Bach threatens the life of Picard's supposed long-lost son, Jason Vigo. In order to get revenge for the death of Bach's son at Picard's hands several years ago. Jason, of course, ends up not being Picard's son, the ruse being the result of a tampered DNA test. This episode's pretty forgettable, suffering once again from the same issues as episodes like Interface and Homeward. The motif of offspring is also present in Emergence, in which the Enterprise computer begins to exhibit self-awareness and a desire to reproduce after being exposed to Verdeon particles from a nearby white dwarf star, an episode marked by an entertaining holodeck adventure on the Orient Express. This precedes the show's penultimate episode, Preemptive Strike, which wraps up Rolaren's arc as she is sent undercover to root out a Maquis cell, only to join them. Can't, if you can't beat them, join them. This is honestly a fantastic choice for her character, I think, as the Maquis, who are rebelling against Cardassian activity in the demilitarized zone following their abandonment by the Federation, is one of the more compelling conflicts in Trek lore. Finally, we have All Good Things, the hour and a half series finale to one of the greatest shows of all time. After Picard is told by Q that Picard is to be the cause of humanity's destruction, Picard must convince his colleagues to journey with him to the Devron system, where an anti-time anomaly has emerged. While he simultaneously shifts through th while he simultaneously shifts through three while he simultaneously shifts through three time periods, past, present, and future. Why do I write alliteration in my scripts? <laughs> The trial never ends. Indeed, some of the elements of the alternate future, such as Picard's Eremotic Syndrome, his retiring to his vineyard, Geordi's optical implants, and the collapse of the Romulan Star Empire have become canon, and the episode's ending, in which Picard joins his senior staff at their poker game, has become one of the most iconic moments in Star Trek. All Good Things is, all things considered, a really strong finale and a pretty interesting sci-fi episode, elevated above its somewhat convoluted technobabble premise by the performances of all the actors and the production design. But despite this strong finish, it should be clear that Season 7 is kind of when TNG went off the rails. Even the writing staff was aware of it. Like I said earlier, I got kind of bored with a lot of the episodes in this season. So I started to multitask. I even made this painting of Tally from Mass Effect in Krita, and I think it gave me repetitive stress injury. But I have to say, while I did kind of tune out towards the end of this TNG rewatch, 
I was actually kind of sad when it was over, because it was over. There were no, there were no more episodes. Oh sh! They made four movies. Cut to black. Coming holiday 2023. Part six of the series. That's. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. By becoming a patron or member, you get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. Links to my PayPal and my social media and merch store are all in the description. And now I want to shout out my top members and patrons at the $25 level and above. B. Kaiser 05, Daniel Carter, Herbcat, Hero in Hong Kong, Captain Kevin Johnson, Commander Kevin Johnson, Lester Lewis, and Tyler King. And a special thanks as well to all of my top PayPal donors for this video. David Walker, Dustin Echoes, Joshua Herbert, and Kevin Johnson again. And for all the rest of you who support me on Patreon and through memberships and who donated super chats and on PayPal to help make this video possible, a big, big thank you to all of you as well. This video would not have been possible without you. I really mean that. So. I appreciate you guys, and uh, like I said, hope you enjoy this. Thank you all so much for watching once again. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. I'm rolling. What? Oh. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Uh, okay, before I totally cut, um, give me a third one, and then just hold your position. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm recoiling because I'm self-conscious. I understand. Is this a good spot? Yeah. Waiting for the right time, yeah. I gotta feel it. Also, I hate to say this, but you gotta be loud, loud. Oh, God. You could say that I'm offering the best of both worlds. <laughs> Let me do that one more time. Use clips for that. I, I, I am really not inclined to read a lot of this. <laughs> <laughs> the emphasis on political, social, and moral dilemmas present in the, okay, present earlier in the season. This is what I go through every time I record a script, by the way. <laughs> I can't fucking remember anything. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, while season five was much weaker on rewatch than I remembered... <laughs> hey, buddy. See, if you're quiet, we c you can stay down here. Instead of Riker becoming acting Cap'n in a... <laughs> Instead of Riker becoming acting Cap... Instead of Riker becoming acting captain in accordance with the 
chain of command. <laughs> uh, we're actually getting through this at a decent pace, I think. Well, we should be finished before 1 a.m. <laughs> but let me know if I'm wrong. Okay. No, no, no. That's not, <laughs> that's not for them to decide. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good blooper right there. Mm -hmm. As many have said, no, God, many people are saying this. <laughs> God, I really want this to be over so hard. <laughs> although he noted that he wished, okay, although, although he noted that he wished more had been done. This is 20 pages, man. <laughs> you might do it in your camera. Yeah. So fucking stupid. This is things that run through my head. Oh no, I've got to. Are you gonna do devouring here? Yeah, I just realized I gotta read all this again in the studio. Yeah, yep. You gotta read all of it in the studio. All right, this is the telepathy thing. <laughs> okay. Give me another uh, yeah. Professor X, but this time it's really hurting you. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> Sounds a little more pleasurable. Than yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could say it was a dark page. <laughs> I think that um, th this is really accelerating my desire to move away from Star Trek content. <laughs> YouTubers with half a million subscribers leave shots in their videos that are not color corrected. Mm -hmm. Although to be fair, I don't think that this tragic event really excuses how overbearing she is with Deanna. You know, it's, it's like it's like lay off it. <laughs> I don't know. What, I don't know how to end that. <laughs> I don't know how to end that sentence. Four more pages. <laughs> Thank you, Ghost Tyler. Okay. <laughs> Tyler, he's allowed to come on to talk about one episode. Yeah. One yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Less divisive is Journey's End, which serves as the conclusion of Wesley Crusher's arc in TNG. And by less divisive, what I mean is everybody hates this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just tell you, while Wesley did have some genuinely great moments, no, uh, no there's nothing great about Wesley Crusher. God, why do I put so much alliteration? <laughs> Elevated above its somewhat convoluted technobabble premise by the performance of all the actors and by the production design. <laughs> it really is like you write it and then you say it and it just, you can't. <laughs> In Sub Rosa, after attending her, her fucking grandma. <laughs> okay. As it turns out, Ronan has been preying on the women in Beverly's... Be Beverly's... Beverly's... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>